Bible is quite clear that there is a kingdom of God that is going to arise on this earth. So the question we're looking at tonight is, is Jesus Christ going to be that king? Because we, yeah, we'll, we'll, what we'll do is, first of all, look back into the Old Testament to see what that has to say about kingship, what it has to say about the kingship of Israel, but also the kingship of that future eternal kingdom. And we'll look through the prophecies and all the things it says about that one who is to be the king of that eternal kingdom. We'll then go through into the New Testament to see what it has to say and how it lays out the case that Jesus, Jesus is that Christ, is that anointed one. And we'll see that it is unequivocal about that. So we know, if we go into the Old Testament, that first thing we'd have to say is that God was king and he's always king so the Lord God is king over the earth and king over Israel for all eternity because the earth is God's his, his, it is his creation he created it for his pleasure so we get this, this reading in, in Psalms where we read the Lord is king forever and ever the nations have perished out of his land so we get the, that idea and this is in a number of places we see this coming to pass we know from the Old Testament that when the children of Israel entered the land of Israel and established themselves as a nation for a period of time they had no king they had no ruler God was their ruler for that period of time but unfortunately by the time we get to the early part of the first book of Samuel we read that the children of Israel rejected God from ruling over them they wanted a king like the nations around them they wanted to they'd looked around and seen all these nations with kings wearing crowns and looking very pompous and full of you know glory and they wanted the same for themselves and so in that account where we read of it they looked for a king they asked for a king and God allowed them to choose a king but unfortunately their choice was a poor one they chose Saul to be king over them and from the outside, Saul looked perfect. He looked every inch the king in the way he carried himself. He was tall, good-looking. He had confidence. He exuded uh, sort of an authority. He was, in their eyes, the ideal king to lead them. But unfortunately, while Saul started well and did some things that showed a faith in God and a trust in God... Unfortunately, as time went by, he trusted more and more in his own judgment, his own thoughts, and his own ways. He turned away from God's judgment, God's justice, God's mercy, and God's love, which was what God had commanded him to do. So God rejected Saul, and God chose somebody else instead. He chose David to be king over his, over his people. And it's interesting to note that David was anointed long before he became king so very much like Jesus Jesus didn't you know hasn't entered into his kingdom yet but he is the anointed one so just like that David was anointed long before he became king so whilst he was the anointed one the messiah he wasn't the anointed one and David is quite clear about it, and then we'll, we'll come on to that to show that David was quite clear that he was not that one that was promised that eternal king to come and whilst he was anointed whilst he was still a lowly person he obviously then was persecuted for a while because king saul once he knew that god had left him and had chosen david to be king he persecuted david for a period of time until god gave david the throne it's quite clear that the bible tells us that it was god who took saul off the throne and it was God who put David onto the throne and God gave it to him what we see in the Old Testament from the beginning to the end so from Genesis all the way through we see a promise of a coming Messiah a coming king a future king of the world and we see this in many examples we see partial examples we see prophecy we see it in types so it's in things like the Passover lamb the tabernacle, the temple, partially through people like King David himself in the way he lived his life, showing some of the characteristics that this future king would have. And also we get people like Moses and Abraham and many others as well who in parts of their lives gave us a little bit of a picture, an idea of who this one was to be. What 
we do learn from reading throughout the whole of the Old Testament is that the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, will be these things. He will be the son of God. He'll be a direct descendant of David. He will be a king. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom. And he will be given these titles and the kingdom by God. His capital on this earth will be in Jerusalem. And he will judge all the nations. So what I'm now going to do is just pick out a very short, small selection of some of the prophecies that tell us about all these aspects of this king that's to come. So our first one is from Zechariah. Now I've got, I'm going to be going through all these on the screen. So um, it's probably going to be uh, easier if you want to follow. Please feel free. But uh, all these references will be up on the screen. So we get these words from in Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming. He is just and having salvation. Lowly and riding on a donkey, a coal the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from the sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. So we see a king over the whole earth. Certainly something that has never happened up until this point in history. So we know that this is definitely something that is yet to come. If we go to the prophecy of Daniel and chapter 7, we get these words. I was watching in the night visions. Behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. So again, we get re reiterating those same points. It's a kingdom that is given to this person by God. So whilst God is king over all, he is equally giving this title to this, this individual, this Messiah, and that this kingdom then will have control over all the peoples. There's no exclusion. All peoples, nations, and languages. There's no individual that is outside of that collective. That covers everybody on earth. And it will never pass away. If we go to the prophecy of Isaiah, we get these very well-known words. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David, and upon his kingdom to order it, and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever." The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So we learn again there. A, it's God who will bring this about. It will be an everlasting kingdom. It will be centered on that throne of David. So the throne of David in Jerusalem, that will be his seat. And it says the government, the rulership over the whole world will be on his shoulders. And these titles will be given to him by God because of his character and because of the work that he's doing. So from passages like this and many, many others, we learn of the character of the Messiah. We learn of the purpose of the Messiah to bring about the salvation of the world. So we know that there were, you know, that Moses and all those people who had lived long before Jesus were still looking forward to him. They knew that his day was coming and were, were glad of it. We've learned of his family, the fact that God will be his father. We learn of the works that he will do. That he will bring that salvation and that then in that kingdom he will reign. What we will now see is that in the New Testament, this Messiah, this Christ, this anointed one, is clearly and unequivocally identified as Jesus. And that there is no alternative option to actually fulfill this, this role. So we come to the reading that we had to, to start with in, uh, in, in, the, in the Gospel of John. And what we see here is a number of things. We see that at the end, we see that these were people who were looking for the Messiah. These were people who were looking. They weren't just, they were aware of what the prophecies were, and they realized that this was the time. They looked around them in the world. They looked at all the signs in the world, at who, you know, the, the Romans in charge, the way Israel was, and they realized that this was the time. This was the time when the Messiah was going to be coming. So they were looking for Jesus. They were looking for that Messiah. And when we see Philip and Nathaniel, 
Philip first meets Jesus and in meeting him and talking to him and seeing him and knowing his character is utterly convinced because when he goes to see his friend Nathaniel there's no doubt in his words we have found him of, of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote Jesus of Nazareth the son of Joseph so we see here he's absolutely adamant all those prophecies we've just read and many many others are fulfilled in this individual and he's convinced Nathaniel less so <laughs> yeah Nazareth didn't have a particularly good reputation and therefore was a bit of ooh, well you know is Nazareth going to be it um but Philip is convinced and asks him to come and Nathaniel trusts Philip sufficiently to say yes I'll go with you and even within a brief period of encountering the Lord Jesus Nathaniel is utterly convinced in his own right just from the response that he gives him and presumably from what Philip's already told him and then based on his first interaction with him Nathaniel this this person who was questioning he, he wasn't utterly convinced he was he was doubtful to start with he was open to it but he wasn't uh, sort of yeah sort of convinced but once he met Jesus then we see that yes he comes out with that statement and that, again just as emphatic uh, yeah sort of we read rabbi you are the son of God you are the king of Israel we also read um, in terms of em the emphasis in the Gospels on Jesus as the King. When we begin the, you know, the Gospel according to Matthew, we get a genealogy. And Jesus, when he's first introduced at the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, is introduced as the son of David and then the son of Abraham. So his link to David is emphasised. So emphasizing the kingship of Jesus. And this also comes out in the, the genealogy, the list of, of his forebears that is laid out in the Gospel of Matthew. What we see is that when it talks about the father of, it introduces each one as the father of the next one, next one in the line, apart from when we get to David. David is the only one who's actually given a title. Because we get to the line in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 6, we read, And Jesse, the father of David, the king. So the kingship of David is emphasised and that link again with Jesus, make it quite plain, here is the one who is going to be that seed of David who will take over the throne of David. Even before he was born, even before he was conceived, we get these words in, in the Gospel according to Luke and chapter 1 and verse 30 where the angel Gabriel is coming to Mary and telling her about the child that she will have. And we get these words. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. So... This is an absolutely emphatic statement, again, highlighting all the same points that you see in the Old Testament in the prophecies about the Messiah. His, the fact that he will be the son of God, the fact that, that it was God who will give him the throne of his father David, and that he will reign over the kingdom forever. And this ties in with the promise that was given from God to King David, that promise that we read of here that he would have this son this descendant who would sit on his throne again and and reign there forever we get these words moreover the lord declares to you that the lord will make you a house when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers i will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and i will establish his kingdom he shall build a house for my name and i will establish the throne of his kingdom forever i will be to him a father and he shall to be me a son and carry on towards the end of that and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me your throne shall be established forever so David was quite convinced that a descendant of his would come who would sit on this throne but this would be a different throne this would be a, an eternal throne that would never end because he knew his life would come to an end David knew his life would come to an end and he knew that you know, the, the kingdom would potentially come to an end as well. But he knew that at some point in the future, God would bring this to pass. Now we know that somebody did sit on the throne of David 
until the days of Zedekiah, when it ceased to exist and has remained so until uh, this day. Here's the, here's the word of God to Zedekiah. And thou profane wicked prince of Israel, whose day is come when iniquity shall have an end, thus saith the Lord, remove the diadem and take off the crown, this shall not be the same. Exalt him that is low and abase him that is high. I will overturn it and it shall be no more until he comes whose right it is and I will give it to him. So Jesus knew all these words. These were words that he knew from a young child. His knowledge of the scripture developed in him from a, a young age. And he knew that these words were talking about him. But he knew also that the time when he first was born, his life then, he was not to take on the kingship at that point in time. That he would die, raised from, be raised from the dead, and then go to heaven to be with his father until that time when God sent him, when God sent him back to establish that kingdom. We also get more further confirmation that Jesus was the king, not from those around him, but people from afar. We know that there were wise men from the east who by some means knew about the prophecy and had a sign that they followed a star that they knew represented the fact that the king of the Jews would be born and that this was significant enough for them to travel a massive distance in those days and put themselves to a great deal of hardship to come and actually worship him. So we get these words. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Israel with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And we know from the record that that is exactly where Jesus was born. That Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea because that was the city that where they were to be uh, sort of counted uh, in the census. So we know again the prophecy being utterly fulfilled in, fulfilled in Jesus' life. And that these people coming from a long way away attesting to this. We also get fulfillment, direct fulfillment of prophecies that we see in, in the Old Testament. So we read about the one coming on the, on, the, on, the, on the cult, on the cult of an ass. And we see that that was carried out exactly in Jesus' life. So there were those disciples that Jesus sent to find the cult and to bring it to him and the words that they were to say if anybody questioned them. And so we read this. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. And as they were loosing the cult, the owners of it said to them, Why are you loosing the cult? And they said, The Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus. And they threw their own clothes on the cult and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then as he was drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So we see again prophecy being absolutely fulfilled perfectly to, this, to the last detail in Jesus' life. We also see him declaring himself that he will be this ruler. So when he was, Jesus was in front of the Sanhedrin, that's, uh, that, that the, uh, the Jewish court, we see that they, they quizzed him about this. As soon as it was day, the elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes, came together and led him into the council, saying, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will by no means believe. And if I also ask you, you will by no means answer me or let me go. Hereafter the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. Then they, said, then they all said, Are you then the Son of God? So he said to them, You rightly say that I am. And they said, what further testimony do we need? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. So these were the people who understood the scriptures and the laws probably better than anybody else. So as soon as he told them that he was going to sit on the right hand of God, the power of God, they knew immediately that that related to the Messiah. 
to that, and the fact that the Messiah would be the Son of God. Hence their, their question of him. Are you then the Son of God? And they, he, you know, Jesus says, you rightly say that I am. So he quite clearly defines and makes it quite plain. He's, he's not sort of beating about the bush. He makes it quite plain that that is the case. And even when he was handed over to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, we then get these words. Then the whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilate. <clears throat> and they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Then Pilate asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him and said, It is as you say. <coughs> so we know that these questions were asked by all of these people. None of them were followers of Jesus. These are people who weren't in, you know, sort of, you know, looking to do him any favours. But from the, his answers, we see a quite clear picture that Jesus was to be that king. But he knew at that time that he wasn't going to be king at this point in time. So again, when Pilate was questioning him again, we get these words in, in the Gospel of John. Jesus answering back to Pilate, answering Pilate's question, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting, that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, so are you a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of truth listens to my voice. So this isn't saying that the kingdom of God is some, somewhere else. We know from scripture it's made quite plain that the kingdom is to be here on the earth. It's just saying that the kingdom was not to be of that point in time. That, that time in the, you know, in, in, in the history of the world was not the time that God had appointed for this eternal kingdom to be established. Because of his mercy wanting more people to come to a knowledge of Jesus and of himself and to turn to them and trust in them. And we know um, that Jesus will return and establish it. This is laid out in multiple places, both in the New Testament, whether you're in Matthew or in Revelation. The angels of God declare it in Acts chapter 1. The apostles teach it uh, you know, to people in Acts chapter 3 and First Thessalonians chapter 4. And it's made quite plain that Jesus will transform the earth and the people and rule over the, as king over the entire earth. So that the whole earth will then give glory uh, to his father, to, to God. Peter made it quite plain. When he was speaking and preaching the word of God, in, in, this is in the Acts of the Apostles, he uses these words. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you about the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us until this day, Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. So we had all the aspects pointing to Jesus as being that seed, that, that fruit of his loins that would, oh, you know, that would come and that would establish you know, the kingdom over the whole earth, reigning from David's city of Jerusalem. And we get these words right to the end. So right from the beginning to the end of the Bible, the message is clear and consistent. So in the, in the, Revela you know, in the book of Revelation in chapter 11, we get these words. Then the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So is the Christ, is that Messiah, Jesus? The Bible says it is. That does raise a few questions though. Why is it then that the people, the rulers at the time of Jesus did not accept this? If they were looking for a Messiah, if they were looking for that Christ to come, and here was Jesus fulfilling all of the aspects that were laid down in the prophecies, was saying and doing all the things that you would expect the Messiah to do, why would they not accept him? And unfortunately this comes down to human nature. The reason they didn't accept Jesus is because the religious leaders of Jesus' day had gone away from the true worship of God.
they thought they were right. They thought they were righteous in their own eyes and they couldn't accept it when Jesus wouldn't accept them. And therefore it was easier for them just to deny Jesus than it was for them to change and accept what he said because it would mean changing their entire lives and it would also mean losing their power, their position and their wealth in this life. They also, I think, missed the distinction between his life the life of the Messiah as the meek lamb, as the sacrificial lamb to take away the sins of the world, and also the second part of his existence on this earth as the conquering king. Unfortunately, they wanted the latter to get rid of the Romans, and they were unwilling to accept that there would be a delay in this. They wanted him to be king now. They weren't keen on the, the lamb. They weren't interested. They just wanted the conquering king. What we can say is that when we look at the prophecies regarding the Messiah that we get in the Old Testament, what's clear is that there has been no time either before or after the time of the Lord Jesus that fits the time period in terms of the world as it was, the way the children of Israel were at that time, the fact that the Romans were in charge. All of these things pointed to this time being the time when the Messiah would come. The fact that the prophecies prophesied that the Messiah would be crucified, a method of execution that was not used by any of the surrounding nations or by the nation of Israel itself previously. And yet that is clearly laid out in the prophecies. And so we can say that no other time and no other person could ever fulfill the prophecies the way that Jesus has and did. So for that reason, we can say that no person previous to Jesus and no person after could meet what the uh, meet the specification laid down in the Old Testament. What we have to recognize though is just as that time when Jesus came was unique and that it was a time when all those prophecies were fulfilled, so also we look at the world around us. So just as Nathaniel was looking at the world around him and looking for the Messiah's return or the, looking for the Messiah to come on the earth, so we too can look around at the signs in the world and see the fact that the prophecies that the Bible tells us about those, the time before the return of Jesus, before the return of the Messiah, before that kingdom will be established, they are the signs are present everywhere in the world around us today as well. And we can see that the world as we have it today that's turned its back on God for the most part is very close to what we would see in the scriptures. And so it means that for us, we have a time now. We have a time to accept Jesus as that Messiah and to follow him and be, you know, like, you know, be one of his disciples. Because if we don't choose not to, the Bible is equally clear about the outcome. Those who are not Jesus's, those who do not follow after Jesus, do not have hope of life in them. But for those who do commit themselves to Jesus, they have that hope of eternal life.